and now we look at realism. Uh, one, one of the things we need to think about is, again, how I've mentioned this pendulum swinging back and forth between movements. You know, we saw it very easily with the Baroque, the Rococo, the Renaissance and Mannerism, and here again, uh, in the previous chapter, we had Romanticism, the idea of the sublime. And now we have the opposite to that, not so much the sublime, the far away, the exotic, but, you know, artists wanting to keep it real, show the world for what it is, rather than some far off exotic thing, find the beauty, or find, you know, make art about what it is that is around you. Um, the, whether it's a harsh reality, whether it's uh, social justice, um, whether it's satire, reality as it is, um, with whatever attitude you choose. And we're going to see various attitudes being shown here. Um, one of the things that's happening here is um, that romantic idea, the individually crafted thing, not so much an important thing anymore. If you, In this day and age, if you go to buy dishes for someone's wedding, you go to Walmart, you go to Dillard's, you go to Amazon, you buy some dishes, boom. Something breaks, you can buy the same dishes. Whereas before, you went to a craftsman, you went to a potter, you went to a guild, and you would get something that was handmade. Now, of course, you can still go to a handmade uh, source. There are fewer and farther between, but they still exist. So I go to Hot Springs, I can buy some uh, sets from a local potter that I like, and I'm all set, ready to go. Because of the Industrial Revolution, that human touch, that individuality is lost. Now, does that mean it's bad? Well, that's for another class to discuss. But that's something that we need to understand is happening. And this is going to influence the art of the time and the ideas that influence the art, that shape the art, and importantly, buy the art. Because it is in this time that the art gallery, the art museum comes around. And art, rather than just being a craft, now it becomes more of a more of a business and those people purchasing those people displaying are going to influence taste as well uh, the, the the idea of the avant-garde comes around now trying to compete for the newest and the most original businessmen they have to find an angle to sell their art they have to sell their product and so here we go uh, getting away from the business, let's first, and all the setup now, let's actually talk about the art. And here in French realism, we have Millet's The Gleaners. Um, whereas Romance and the Rococo had these very pastel, light, bucolic uh, situations, we have something a little more harsh in contrast in reality. We have plenty. We have everyone gathering together. Where well, the harsh reality is, not everyone is a part of that. Not everyone can afford that. And those pastel colors kind of are subordinate to the background. I mean, are subordinate to the foreground now. The foreground is that the poor uh, are allowed to get what's left. Uh, the poor with their arched, uh, pained backs, uh, their bleeding knuckles, their <sighs> monuments. They are monuments to uh, uh, the struggle. You know, people joke about the struggle being real, but here the struggle is real. This, this is life. People gleaning for what's possibly left after this bounty and harvest. Uh, typically, in my underground classes, some will say that this is about uh, slavery and African Americans. African Americans. Uh, this is about black people, but they are not black. They're not brown. They're, in fact, uh, white uh, French people. So, white French people that have become tan from working out in the field. We get that idea of the red the red neck from uh, out working out in the field. Obviously, she's going to have a t very tanned neck, very dark skin, um, just from working out in the field. If you have a, a parent or a family member, someone that's been working out in the field a lot, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, this is pretty far from the mythical, the classical, the gods and goddesses, the beautiful islands off in the distance. This is pretty far from where all that is. Um, the gods have been reduced to one because now you don't have polytheism so much. You have the one god and following that uh, 
Christian tradition of having the horizon line divide heaven and earth in the realm of earth, the realm of man, everyone has been isolated by a single head using isosophily, and God kind of looks down. When you look at this painting, um, it's there's nothing romantic happening, nothing really glorious happening. It looks um, like some people are bored, some people are genuinely mourning, and some people are doing their job, kind of going through the motions. Whereas one boy is like, uh I mean, look at him. Really? <laughs> Does he look excited? Uh, he's like, I mean, what is he saying? Is he like, Father, Father, I gotta go pee. <laughs> Are we done yet? Or something like that. And the one man holding the the thing, the objects that goes between the worlds, it draws your attention with that silver, golden sphere, that conduit from the heavens to the earth. That one man looks at us, as if to say, where will you go? Or, um, can you believe this? It's, it's, kind of on the, it's kind of on a seesaw. It could go either on the fence. It could go either way. What is he thinking? Because death is supposed to be this heavy, serious thing. Does everyone feel that way? Does everyone act that way at the funeral? Are some people uh, genuinely sad to be there? You know, there was a time that some people would actually pay for mourners to come and be sad. Um, are those people professional mourners? That's neither here nor there. I'm, I'm trying to build up a context, build up thinking about this, because this was a fairly revolutionary painting. For one, if you go back and look in the book, you'll see that this is a monumental, I mean, it is a large, large painting. And so critics at the time were asking, why would you paint this? Two, why would you make it so big? Well, it brings everyone to the same level. It glorifies the mundane. It talks about, you know, we could go on and on and on, but this was realism, painting life as it really is. Whether sad, whether happy, whether hypocritical, whether serious, this was life. Our next French artist, uh, Henri Daumier, known more for his drawings and cartooning, he was author, also an accomplished painter. Much of his process lied in drawing, though. Here he shows the third class. People uh, not of great means, sitting on the train with others, their backs to the more affluent, the more wealthy, uh, humble, sitting together. Uh, it is wealth, which becomes a popular topic in some of his more famous works. Uh, here, though, we have the freedom of the press. On the right hand, you have these fat, ignorant, bloated, narcissistic kind of rulers. The crown kind of tend to each other like they're so important. And on the left, you have these uh, fat, ineffectual, uh, clueless bureaucrats. Okay, and these self-important people are so consumed with what they think is important. Meanwhile, uh, using an, an example of using a the example of a strong, healthy, uh, standing, straight-up kind of man, you have the liberty of the press, the freedom of the press, the truth, uh, the truth and freedom must reign and must stand tall. Whereas you have these horrible examples uh, in the background. You know, the bureaucrats fumbling with themselves, fighting with each other, the, the people in power, the rulers kind of, well, they don't look strong at all. They look very thin, very weak, uh, holding on to their wealth and tending to each other without a clue. It is drawings like that, drawings, uh, another drawing you'll see in the book of the king or a king-like person being fed, bloated, you'll see drawings like this that the French government feared. You see, images really can speak more than words, and these images, well, they became powerful. If you read the book, you'll read about the censorship of them and the effect that Daumier would have. 
And that's, of course, worth more attention, but for the sake of time, we're going to move on to the next great bombshell, and that is photography. Painting, or drawing, drawing rather, with light. Now, the photograph was not an instant, there it is, that's how it works. The photograph was a process that was long, drawn out. The first camera was not even a box. It's not even what we think of. But, um... And, and getting the picture was even more arduous. Imagine your kitchen or your living room, the biggest room in your house. Imagine the biggest room in your home and uh, fill it full of bottles and beakers and chemicals like a chemistry set. And uh, that's pretty much how the first camera, the first photographic image was working. It was tough. It was dangerous. It was explosive. And there was no surefire way yet to get that image perfect and consistent. So the French government, they uh, held this competition to get consistent shots. And Daguerre was the person who helped to develop that, to fix the image. And so the photograph was born, and then the challenge was raised. Is this art? Now, some would say that no, it's not art. You just you take a box, click... There it is. I now have a photograph which gives me more detail than any drawing or any painter could ever make, right? I mean, just because I use a blender and make margaritas doesn't make me a perfect chef or perfect bartender. Just because I use a refrigerator and a knife and fork does not make me, you know, um, some, great, some great popular chef from TV or something. No, it's a tool. Photography is not art. Well, others would say that photography is art. Daumier, in this uh, cartoon of Nadar, would say that Nadar was an artist, whereas many people, you know, use, photo use cameras and, you know, they take pictures and that's nice, but Nadar was an artist. On Facebook, you'll occasionally get uh, people who uh, decide to take some pictures and right beneath a couple of pictures everyone starts saying wow you should be a professional oh my gosh you're so good I wish I could take pictures like you does that make them an artist because they have a couple of good pictures that's mm, neither here nor there and that's a, probably a discussion for another class but this is the this is the the temperature of attitudes towards photography and some they did not consider it art, whereas others, they did. And in America, one of our great early photographers was Matthew Brady, who's most known for his portraiture. You see, artists, they have to decide, well, one, what are we going to photograph? Two, how are we going to compose them? It's not just a random shot. Someone had to decide, well, Mr. President, I'd like you to hold your hand or put your hand on this book because, you know, the book will symbolize literature and learning. You're a man of learning. And to make it classical, we're going to put this Greek column behind you to make you look like a man of classical learning. We're going to have you stand upright. We're going to have you stand straight to make you look tall, knowledgeable, proud, strong. Those are decisions that artists make. Anyone can make them, yes. So, does that mean anyone can be an artist? Well, maybe. Uh, the test of time shows that many people consider photography an art. So, we'll leave it at that. Now, art has to contend with drawing, photography, and so many other things, which will lead us into the next chapter. But, we need to continue with painting, because now we're moving to the States. Remember that couture effect, you know, by the time something was popular in Europe, it takes time to get across the ocean, that popular thing, maybe it's tacos, maybe tacos come from Europe and tacos are now really popular in America and everyone loves tacos. Meanwhile, while tacos are popular in America, maybe now in Europe it's all about donuts and people have never heard of donuts in America, so it takes time to get across the water. So in this, with that in mind... <laughs> Um, now I'm hungry. With that in mind, uh, the Baroque and the Rococo aesthetics of light and dark, the attention to texture, they're still very strong. And that idea of realism rings strong and true in America as well. 
here in the Gross Clinic, we have uh, not a romantic operation, but rather a real a kind of snapshot, if you would. Uh, trying to photograph something like this probably would have been extremely difficult. So um, Eakins has painted the scene using that Baroque light and dark, using the Rococo attention to texture. Uh, he has drawn attention again with that Baroque idea of light being intelligence and wisdom and uh, enlightenment, darkness being ignorance, those left in the dark just kind of watching, whereas that person halfway between the light and the dark is taking note. Meanwhile, the uh, wife, sister, daughter, what have you, is kind of cringing to the sounds of horror of the person being cut open. Now, Henry Oswald Tanner gives us something very different. He takes scenes from the Bible and paints them as if they were happening now. So he adds realism uh, to a fantastic scene. Uh, kind of going back to that idea of if the Last Supper were to happen now, how would it happen? Well, I think it would happen in a sports bar or something. Instead of a bag of money, maybe Judas is holding a cell phone. So that's a realistic scene of a fantastic moment. And also Tanner's faith inspires him to show these scenes. After traveling in the Middle East, he's seen the area, he's seen the environment, and he adds a realistic element to these uh, incredible scenes. And we can see that here in the Annunciation, which is a topic that's been covered before in painting. In one instance, the angel is painted as an angel, whereas in another, it's painted as a source of light. And here, the angel appears as a column of light. So, we're ending, we're almost ending the chapter, and we're ending our section on painting. And we can already see the beginnings of a shift in how paint is handled. And this kind of starts, starts turning the wheels for Impressionism. I'm going through this rather fast, uh, but uh, let's think for a minute. If we look back at some of the paintings, we can see that the paint is very... It's not as detailed as the classical... As Sorry, it's not as detailed as the neoclassical paintings of before. It's not as richly textured in some cases as the neoclassical, uh, as the romantics. It's a bit fast. Here, certainly, it's a bit loose. But it gives us enough detail to understand what's happening. Now, that looseness, in the case of Manet, has only logically evolved into something like this. Luncheon on the Grass and Olympia. Now, what you need to understand is these people I mean they're just doing their thing this is what they did uh, Olympia while uh, presented in an almost Venus like pose is seen by many as a prostitute she's got nice jewelry she's got nice sheets and she does not appear to be ashamed uh, to be nude she even has a servant and a cat, and flowers, a gift. This was an affront to French sensibilities, especially uh, to one particular painter, Courbet. He thought the painting was too loose. He thought, you know, where's the detail? I mean, even I gave more details to my paintings. Um, if you look here, you can see that there's much more texture, much more attention to detail. Whereas in Olympia, he said it was almost very flat. And you can see that with some of the quick, thick brush strokes. So this was not how painting was made, critics would say. Uh, and this is not what you would present. This is not beautiful. This is not classical. Well, it's somewhat classical. The pose is somewhat classical. Uh, but in France at this time, you did not show a woman's bare foot. A woman was not meant to be shown as fat. You did not show rolls of fat. So that, you know, nudity was accepted in classical terms if it was presented in a certain way. You know, and, and if you go to some parts, okay, so nowadays, if you go to some parts of America, if you eat a hot dog with mustard, 
that's the way it should be. If you eat a hot dog with ketchup, you're a freak. Now, I'm not going to start a hot dog conversation here. It's not hot dog class, but I'm trying to make an example. And so in this case, you did not show women in this way. Add to the fact that he has painted it so loosely. He has taken these very thick uh, brush strokes uh, just to imply there's a light, there's a dark. It's not worked in. It's not detailed enough. It doesn't have all the attention that it should. It's an impression, would you say? It's the impression. It's kind of the gesture, the, the impression of the moment. This would really open the door open the door for Impressionism. Um, it was rejected flat out. People laughed at it. People were insulted. Why would you make a painting like this and put it here? That's not art. This is that transition piece to Impressionism. This is that transition artist. And so, um, because of some of the choices he made, people were shocked. They, reject, they rejected it. Later it would become accepted and rev they would revere him and you know he provides a great transition into the next chapter a lot of things happen in this chapter chapter both politically socially artistically and technologically now technology is really the, the last thing left in construction now we we, we take construction what does that have to do with art well construction allows us to make better bridges better bigger brighter buildings the age of glass and steel is almost almost upon us and if you think about what came before sorry <laughs> I had to cough there I had to stop it there's a little thing called load-bearing construction now heavier at the bottom lighter at the top that we know but we don't see any kind of modern, romantic, or realistic new decorative techniques. This appears more, this appears more gothic than anything. It appears more heavy and lifeless, more Romanesque. Gothic is really the appropriate term. They are gothic arches. Um, so what's going on here? Well, you just have new technology. But you don't have new style. You see, especially in something like architecture and buildings, it takes time for those to catch up. And so the technology has advanced well beyond the style. People did not give that much attention to the way the building looked. So the, now they've fallen back on Renaissance decorations. And if you look, think back to something like the Colosseum, you probably remember that going along the entablature, along the top, uh, we see very, very similar decorations throughout the Renaissance period. And now, instead of creating something new, they simply repeat it because, you know, buildings up until a certain point were only so tall. And the decorations, they were set, they fit, they worked within that. And so now when you add, you know, five, six, seven more floors, what do they do? They just repeat it. They make the arch a little taller. That's all. Now, eventually, style, what have you, design will catch up with the architecture. They'll think about how they can innovate and use the engineering to help create more style and designs. But this, you know, we're looking at what's happening at this time. Truss construction. Steel cables allow for more innovative construction. Um, suspension bridges, daguerreotypes, not many new words, but uh, we certainly need to be aware of what avant-garde means um, because, of the in, because of the creation of the art gallery and the art museum in this period, it's certainly going to influence taste. And when you think about uh, art Museum A features this artist, whereas Art Museum B features this artist. People reject this, but they want something new, so what are they going to do? That's going to have a strong impact on the nature of, of taste, the nature of what's being made. And so we've seen this progression from the Romantic, which was a reaction against the Neoclassical, 
So the neoclassical uh, gets reacted. We have, we have the romantic period. Everything's romantic and light and beautiful, and people react against that with the realist, the realism. And now people are going to react to that. Well, not so much just to that, but they're going to react very specifically to something else, and it's this. If the camera exists, if, we, if I could take a picture, why do I need a painting? Well, that's the question I want you to think about as you move into the next chapter. So uh, that's it for now. If you have any questions, I'll kind of zip through this. Usually I take longer. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call, uh, drop by the office, email me on Blackboard, or uh, using your regular email. Thanks again.